one. This is the Council Subcommittee on Water Issues meeting. July 6, 9.30 is our start time, and thank you all for being here. Um, so can we have a roll call, please? Chairman Ware? Here. Chair Member Good? Present. And Chair Member Good. Chair Member. Here, yeah, something like that, here. <laughs> Okay, public comment will be accepted following each agenda item and are limited to three minutes uh, as we usually go through that process. Please complete a comment card and return it to the city clerk. Speakers will be called in the order in which they were received. First item we have is item A, which is approval of June 1st um, minute of the meeting. Has everybody looked at those? I move approval. Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Okay, and uh, we're going to start. Who's going to run the water service application? Gwen, is that going to be you or? Yes. All right. We are ready, I think, for you. You must have just unlocked the door. <laughs> All right. There you go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kay Sitta, Water Resource Project Manager for the City of Prescott. Good morning. Good morning. We're happy to have you there, because if you weren't there, we'd have to be. <laughs> That'd be a horrible thing. <coughs> Why did drive last week crazy? Water service application number 21-007 is for Gateway Apartments. It's filed on be by Stroh Architecture on behalf of Platinum Equities in New York. It is 144 units. Uh, it has drought tolerant landscaping and a 1200 square foot clubhouse. The total estimated demand is 18.28 acre feet per year. It's on 4.0 acres of land, and Gateway Apartments will be over by the Gateway Mall on a parcel right behind the mall. Oh, yes, okay. Scroll down too much. There we go. It's going to be 144 units in two different buildings. You can see uh, parking spaces. A low water use drought tolerant plant list was shared with each one of the applicants here today. As long as as well as a list of our washing machines, high efficiency washing machines, because a number of these units I think will be purchased by the developer. Are there any questions? Yeah, I didn't see anything on there about a pool. There's not, I don't see anything there either. Is that? This one has just the clubhouse. Clubhouse, okay. Mm -hmm. Did they, I know that's not common, but did they submit an architectural landscape plan? Because as I look at this, it's kind of hard to see anything on there that shows me well, landscaping. Um, no. <laughs> I mean, I, it's I don't, not necessary for the application, but, you know, right. we start talking about a very visible spot in our community and talk, talk about landscaping. Are they following the city code? When it comes to number of plants and trees and shrubbery, has that all been? Yes, sir, they are. I, that, I worked with each one of these applicants. They're all new, all four of them. 
and I worked with each one of the four on their low water use plants and the amount of square footage okay. and the 1.5 acre feet per acre per year demand. <coughs> okay. So that is included in their total demand, yes. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up because it is important. And it's it, this was shared with each one of the applicants who are here this morning. And it's specific to Prescott AMA. Could you have those printed up and share them with us as well? I sure will. Mm -hmm. I can sure, do that. I'm sure the commissioners would appreciate it. Of course. Anything else, Phil? You have any comments down there? Uh, how many stories will these be? Um, we ha we do have planning manager here today because these projects are all permitted as a matter of zoning. So um, we're only considering water here today, but he's came in order to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, at this stage, it's been through our pre-application review, and they indicated three stories for the buildings, but we don't have building construction plans in yet for uh, those structures, so that could vary somewhat. Uh, the business regional zoning of the mall would allow up to four stories uh, for residential type buildings. Okay, and that is, uh, the residential units based upon code are allowed by law? They are allowed by right, yes. Which means it does not have to go back through planning commission? That's correct. So that's something that is made in judgment by the staff on, on the plans? Typical of our review process, all of the departments involved will get a review of the construction plans when they come in. Part of that review includes landscaping. You asked earlier about landscape plans. We actually do account of landscape materials um, based on location in the LDC. It says where they have to be and how many, and then based on the type of plants out of the AMA's guide. And the calculations for parking and everything else have been done the same way? So okay. far, it looks like they meet the requirements. Again, when we have the actual plan submitted, we do the whole review all over again in more detail. Mm -hmm. And if they're short of parking spaces, they'll have to amend their plan to adjust for those parking spaces. So in re-reviewing those plans, you asking for a water agreement here that we push on to council, but is this overall plan going to come back to council or only just the water? I believe only just the water because of the type of use that's proposed Okay, uh, does not require separate council action. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Phil? No, I just want to say that I um, I support this type of uh, infill development. Uh, it's in the city limits. It creates a, almost a guaranteed customer base for the uh, th for the mall, and um, all of the uh, city utilities, public safety, everything else is already being provided. So um, it adds uh, more. I think I've made comments that. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about being able to have workforce housing and uh, rental units. And, uh, this is an opportunity for the market to respond. So uh, when they know there's a uh, high demand for rental units, and um, I'm sure they'll get these uh, uh, rented very promptly, um, I think this is the type of uh, development that not only supports the ongoing uh, viability of the mall complex, uh, but it is able to provide... Uh, more uh, rental uh, opportunities, and uh, I think this is just uh, the kind of reutilization of uh, mall space that uh, will benefit the city in the long run. Okay. Mr. Schistica. I have nothing else to add, Mr. Okay. Chair. Anything on Zoom? Yes, we have uh, Leslie Hoy. Okay. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Leslie. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, I have a question. Are the apartments going to have individual water meters? And I have the same question for all the rental units that are on today's agenda for the water service applications. Okay, thank you for your question, Leslie. We'll have somebody answer that. I'm sure it's going to be a quick answer, but thank you for your question. I'm afraid I don't know if there are going to be individual water meters. Um, my understanding was that it was going to be, um, I wrote down the square footage here. Let me go back to my, my notes. I doubt that. They were going to have about 23,000 square feet of landscaping. And I believe that the, um, the water is going to be provided to those low water use areas. I don't think that there are going to be, and I think there are a few common areas, 
but I don't believe the individual apartments themselves will be landscaped. Well, I, I guess from my standpoint, um, you know, we often talk about affordability and every time you hook a in individual water meter to each apartment, now you're kicking up the price of each unit. So I don't see that that's going to be happening. So we, Let so me we ask don't you. know under the, um, until the plans come in what the intention of the applicant is. But typically in these scenarios, we see a common master meter per building that's uh, stipulated in the land development code or the, the city code today under chapter two, that each building must have its own meter regardless of whether they want to master meter the site. So again, that would be contemplated at the time that we see the plans. Well, and I have a question for, excuse me, Mr. Chair. As I remember, uh, we were allocating 0.15 per rental unit with a master a meter and if if each one was metered if each one was metered separately it would be 0 0.12 we under the um, water resource management model we are contemplating this development at 0 0.12 acre foot That's per dwelling I unit looked at yes we are so so that would that would say to me that each each individual unit's going to have a meter because we, we said that 0.15 would be with a master meter. Again, because we don't have, we don't have the plans actually in for review to, to know the applicant's intention. Um, we will monitor their water use through the WORM, we, the sure. water resource management model, sorry, um, over time and adjust those numbers accordingly based on actual water usage. But we anticipate low water usage in this instance because it is a rental product there's, there will be minimal outdoor watering. There's no pool, uh, only a clubhouse use on occasional use, uh, occasional use basis. So we are anticipating the water use to be lower here. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else? Oh, well, Leslie Hoy has her hand up again. Let's. Okay, Leslie. Leslie. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, the, well, the reason I asked that question and Councilman and Sishka just spoke to that. Um, a few years ago, maybe it was only two or three, we did talk about then um, having individual water meters, not for outdoor use, but for indoor use, because when the editing, um, there's research that shows that that encourages indoor conservation. Um, when there's only a master meter, then the individuals inside the building don't have any incentives to conserve water because they can't see what their own usage is and they're not usually paying their own water bill. So that's why I asked this question and it would also apply to the other, I, some of these are um, houses for rent, but so I, anyway, I'd like to know for each of these water service applications, are we going to have individual water meters to encourage, incentivize um, conservation in, in these developments? Leslie, the only comment that I'd have on that, again, affordability of those apartments, when each meter, how much does each meter cost now, roughly? They cost around $350 a piece. Okay, so, right, each one of them has an impact fee. That would, I was going to say, and that would be in addition to the, but you asked me the cost of the meter. Well, the okay, the meter, and what's the cost on the impact fee? It varies from area to area, um, but it's probably around $2,000 okay. a piece. I'm, I'm just off the top of my head here. And, and from my standpoint, we have already talked about the process of them using low flow, you know, dishwashers and low flow, um, you know, washers machines. and that kind of stuff how much water can they actually use i know we're worried about water but we're talking about you know no inside or no outside plants on the structures so i think we can be defeatist here if we start jacking the prices up of the apartments just based upon trying to watch how much water is used through the worm we can do that with each individual building and then dividing the number of units to that building to find out what we're actually using correct that's correct okay However, um, the problem is, and we own a re uh, rental in a building that has a meter, a master meter. When there's a leak, you can't tell which apartment it's coming from. So there's, you know, there's a lot of good reasons to have individual meters. 
Okay, Leslie, thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Okay, did we get through with 5A then? Everybody's off Zoom now? Yes. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to a motion. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I move we pass this uh, on to council. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes three to nothing. That sounds like a softball game. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to the next the item, 5B. Yeah. <laughs> 5B, please. Trying, oops, I'm trying to zoom in on this. 5B. <clears throat> <clears throat> Water service ap application number 21-008, Predator Ridge at Prescott Lakes. It's on 24.3 acres of land. It was filed by Chris Hundelt on behalf of Keystone Homes and MJF Properties. It's 128 single-family residences, but they are for rent. It will include a clubhouse, pool, and site amenities. It is estimated to come in at, let's see, I wrote down the twenty three point four zero acre feet per year. Let me scroll down to some site plans here. There are very steep gradients at this property, so it's believed that most of the surrounding landscape will remain native vegetation. And I have already figured in the low water use plants. Again, it's a common area, about 32,000 square feet of common area at a 1.50 acre feet per acre per year. And uh, this is the location of it in Prescott Lakes. And this is um, not looking north. Have to rotate it a little bit, 90 degrees clockwise. But it's these two parcels here. In case you'd like to look at the site plan again. It does meet the criteria of the zoning, correct? Yes, it does. What is the zoning on that piece of property? Um, let's see, it's on the application here. And now I need to change glasses and zoom in. <laughs> There it is, BRBG. And that means what to people that are listening on the Zoom? Business general? Business regional, business general? I'm not sure. Can you help me, George? Yes, that's correct. So, again, business regional, business general were designated in that portion of Prescott Lakes. They allow the full range of uses, as you're aware, in our code because of the hierarchy of code uses. So multifamily residential is permitted by right under that zoning. So this was figured out at 0.18 acre foot per year, right? Uh, 0.17 acre point feet one per seven. year. Mm -hmm. I got 0.18, so it, we're in the same ballpark. Right, but it, we had, we added on the clubhouse and pool amounts, that which brought up the total acre feet per year a little bit, but about one acre foot. Okay. Questions, Phil? Well, this is supposed to be connected to a future extension of uh, Smoke Tree Lane. So when is that going to be built and who pays for it? That I can't answer. George, can I turn that over to you again, please? Uh, typical of the process of development, the construction of initial infrastructure is the developer's responsibility. The initial extension of that roadway will either be by this developer or in concert with the adjacent parcels that will benefit from that development. 
What, a, what adjacent parcels? So the extension of smoke tree actually, yeah, there you go, would connect to parcels to the south of this one and potentially parcels to the east of this one um, if the extension of the roadway goes all the way through along the south boundary of this development. And this development has one way in and one way out, so all these buildings have to be sprinklered. Is that correct? That's what was called out during the PAC review of it, mm -hmm. yes. And you're going to have one master meter for all these uh, single-family rental homes. I, I don't know what their proposal is at this point in time, but this development would be more but conducive to have individual meters just because they are laid out more like individual single-family homes. But that is something that um, I'm not aware of. I think their PAC said that they were going to have one or two master meters for all this. Master meters are the usual approach initially by developers for multifamily projects. There's a cost savings in the number of meters and the cost of the single larger meter than multiple smaller. So are these homes, are these rental homes going to be uh, in a master association or are they going to uh, be owned individually and then rented out? It is a single parcel with a single development and a single owner. So this is um, an apartment building with apartment units scattered over the whole site. Yeah. So picture it as an apartment building for the purpose of ownership. Um, anything other would require subdivision plat process to create a condominium type of situation where individual homes could be separately owned. So this is not proposed for that at this time. Yeah, and just if, if, if that were to occur, then each of those separate lots would have to be metered according yeah. to the city code. So because it's a single lot, it, they, they can do under the city code a, a master, a single master meter. This essentially is, as George is saying, a three or four story apartment building, just one story spread out over a big parcel of land. It's the equivalent of that, even though it looks like single family homes. This seems to be a trend in development of multifamily in other parts of the country gives people a feel of being in their own house. Um, so it's something we may see more of. In fact, we have, anybody we on, have, <clears throat> excuse me, go ahead. Anybody on Zoom? No, there's nobody. Bill? Well, I'm just thinking that these need to be uh, individually metered. Uh, there's way too many homes here to have a master meter and uh, no incentive to uh, um, utilize um, water in an efficient manner. Um, boy, I just think this is a uh, rush to development here. And I would, I would agree with you to this point. I think each one of them should be individual metered the way it's laid out. City so. code would give permission. I mean, that, that, that's a hard line answer is city code, because it's a single lot, allows for a single meter. Okay. So, I mean, if ultimately and, the council wants to change that eventually, uh, you have to change the city code. Okay. So, the way it looks, it stands at this time. Is there a move to move it to council? Yeah. I motion uh, we move to council. Uh, any discretionary decision on this? It says here that 2-1-24... Uh, that every separate building supplied with city water must have its own separate service connection, except that two or more buildings located on the same lot or contiguous lots under the same ownership or property known as support uh, may, upon permission granted by the public works director, be supplied through the same connection and meter as long as single ownership continues. Upon change from single ownership, a new and separate connection shall be immediately made. And so, like I said, it's... it's uh, essentially provided the city code uh, I'm not, and I don't I, I would defer to when I'm not sure how much discretion the public works director has in something like this because again this is not you have to apply the same standard so simply because these look like single-family homes are effectively a um, an apartment complex that's that's correct uh Mr. Palladini, as a general rule, the public works director, unless there's um, an underlying reason to not allow a master meter, 
We generally do approve master meters, <coughs> and not only um, <coughs> because the code says that we can, but because everything behind that master meter at that point becomes the responsibility of the property owner. The city does not maintain anything behind the master meter. Oftentimes, um, fire hydrants will be required around this loop. Those will also be privately maintained. So if it's um, not required by code that, that public infrastructure be placed there, then generally we would prefer that these things be private as it reduces maintenance costs for the city. Yeah, so these would be private accesses paid for by the owner. These, uh, maintained these are not, by the owner. These are not roadways. These are driving yeah. aisles in a parking lot. Yeah. And the water lines that will run through them will be water lines that serve just like a yard line would from the street to a home, except in this case it will serve the entire development. Okay. Or well, can you imagine if you had a wildfire coming up that hillside and all these people trying to get out at once? Yeah, with sprinkling, it would uh, slow the situation down. But boy, I really have problems with the one in, one out, um, especially development of this size and this density. So we're just approving the amount of uh, water being uh, requested or allocated here. Correct. So, and what's that calculation? Uh, Twenty-three point four acre feet per year. And that's based upon, uh, what, a 0.17 per unit? Yes, sir, plus the um, additional clubhouse and swimming pool. And oh, the low water use landscaping are all figured into that number. There again, we're talking about infill here, so. And it says uh, the development could potentially include a, a clubhouse. So that doesn't necessarily mean there will be one. Pleasure, gentlemen. I, um, okay, I made the motion. I'll second it. Based upon city code, we are all bent to do anything any different. So, then a motion is second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Bill, what were you there? Well, if I can't vote no, well, hell, I'll vote no anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we'll go on to council with a two to one vote as shown in the minutes. Uh, item 5C, please. That's kind of tells the states, right? 200 single family residential. I'm skipping past one here just a minute. I'm looking for 2009. Well, this is a trend because we have three applications this morning that are all about rental properties. Um, okay. Granite Dells Estates. It's on 17.7 .7 acres. It's water service application number 21-008. It was filed by Chris Hundelt on behalf of Keystone Homes and Granite Dells Estates Properties. It's located at the roundabout at Granite Dells Parkway and Dells Ranch Road, the northeast area of it. It is a 200 single family residential rental complex on two parcels to include a clubhouse, swimming pool, and additional site amenities. The water demand is estimated at 32.82 acre feet per year. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, right. <laughs> yes, I did recalculate it, and I did make an error. It's 35 acre feet per year, not 32.82. My mistake. Thank you, Gwen. 
What is it currently zoned at the present time? It is also BRBG. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so here's the site plan. Try to bring it down just a little, oops, bring it down a little bit. You can see more of it. Again, it's quite dense. Uh, not a lot of landscaping. A few trees there, mostly parking and and homes. <laughs> and it is quite dense. <laughs> and we also use the demand factor of 0 0.17. Parking there is it? Well, again, this is for this is for a water assessment, and all the plans have not come in yet, so it's hard to depict exactly uh, through the process of planning and zoning of the number of parking spaces and those types of things, but for water allocation, based upon them meeting the general criteria of the code, city code, that it meets all the stipulations, I'd have to say I'd make a motion to move it on to city council. Second. Well, what's the total water allocation request? 35 acre feet per year. So a 200, for 200 units. Is that about right? All right. Well, we'll have to see how the how well that uh, planning comes forward for the uh, final construction, but uh, the water seems to be appropriate for this. And the ingress egress as well. I mean, oh, there's yeah. Yeah, there's it's... room. I, I guess you know. Again, George, because uh, it's a relatively new development. The neighbors, I assume, on the back side of that are aware of the zoning that they're going to have rentals right up next to them. There aren't any direct neighbors on three sides of it. Right. On the east side, there are uh, platted residential lots. Um, that is something that was part of the original master plan is either a commercial or residential um, multifamily use on this site. So the point I make is we, we, that hasn't changed. No, no, that so hasn't changed. We're not. The, uh, the layout of this one, similar to the past uh, one being a distributed multifamily, is the only thing that's different. Previously, it was anticipated to be multiple multi-unit buildings okay. instead of scattered like this. Very good. Any any motion? I Anybody on Zoom? They, uh, yes, we do have two people. Meters as well. What'd you say? I'm uh, sorry. I just hope they have individual meters as well, but okay. uh, we'll have to see how that develops. Did you say you had somebody on Zoom? Yes, we do. Well, yeah. Realistically, somebody's going to have to pay the water bill. I mean, yeah, individual metered or not, somebody's going to end up paying the water bill. Well, true, but if you have individual meters, oh, you're right. You're you're, you're exactly sure. right. Absolutely, you would hope that the owner of the uh, of the development would sit back and go, uh, "Excuse me, this is awfully expensive." So, uh, um, to some degree, that would that would limit that situation. But I agree with you, Bill. Okay, Leslie, go ahead. Okay, well, <clears throat> it looks like there's competing interests here between saving water, um, the cost, and who's going to pay it. And I understand why Public Works would like to not have to deal with what's behind the master meters, but we never contemplated this kind of distributed development at the time we were working on the water policy. And so I think we need to re-examine this in light of what's going to happen, especially if there's going to be more of these. Um, and I don't know how that gets re-examined. Um, a question I have is, at what point using the worm are we going to see what the actual water use is? Um, earlier, we were told um, during the form formulation of the water policy that at the end of five years, we would be re-examining the water use, but the cow will already be out of the barn by then. 
So, okay, I see Gwen is going to answer some of this. Hi, Leslie. So, so the, the, um, the city updates the worm annually. So from the time they go onto water, we will begin to monitor the usage. We use five years as an estimate of what the average use will be. But we'll know in the first full year after they're on the city's water system how much water this development is actually using. And it will probably, or it will, be developed over time. So it'll take a few years for it to completely be built out as well. But we should be able to tell each year, at the end of each uh, the calendar year, we update the utility billing information into the worm, and it tells us what this site is using in terms of water. And we're assuming that all of these units are going to be rented all of the time. That's correct. And that's I'm probably sure the not, applicant would like that. That's probably not too. realistic. <laughs> probably not. There is a there tends to be turnover in in rentals. There's turnover in ownership as well. But yes, rentals tend to have turnover. But say the water usage is more than we thought at the end of the year or five years, then what? I mean, you're kind of stuck. What are you, what are you going to do then? Well, I, th I think that's a true statement throughout the city, not just on this particular development. And in the worm, we do classify different types of development and we compare their water usage to get an average water usage by that type of development. And we'll adjust those numbers in the worm accordingly as, as time passes. That's what, the, uh, that's what a model does. It's predictive. And so then you would deduct the actual usage from what you'd see as your remaining bucket of water? So, so we would report it to the state in terms of water that we're actually pumping toward the maximum amount of water that we're allocated to pump in a year. We would adjust that number annually in our annual report to ADWR. Okay, I'm glad that you're talking. Well, I'm not glad. I wish you were thinking about water in the same way you might think about money. <laughs> That's my comment, but thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Okay. Okay, now we have Peter Krupnik. Go ahead, Peter. Yes, I noticed in that site plan that there was no open space at all, let alone parking, as uh, Steve mentioned. Uh, we have pressure to apply by not approving the water until all the city codes have been met. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Any other comments? That's it. Okay. Anything else from staff? No, sir. Okay. Anything from the group up here, Steve? No. Okay, for look for a motion for item 5C. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 3-0. So let's move on to item 5D. Back up. Hmm. <coughs> water service agreement, uh, water service application number WSA 21-010 is on 28 acres of land. It was filed by Jason Hersker for Capital Development Group. And the owner, 1800 Iron Springs Land, LLC. It is over on Iron Springs Road. So I'll go ahead and let you be looking at the plat here. The design. Let me bring it down. It's on Iron Springs Road, and um, I get them lost my place here. Anyway, it's called the Parks at Iron Springs. That's its tentative name. It's a mixed-use rental project 
of 203 units. It includes one, two, and three bedroom homes, some attached, and some are single dwellings. Residences will be for rent with common open space areas, natural beauty and topography to be uh, retained wherever possible. There is a clubhouse and some minor landscaping demand. And a factor of 0 0.17 was applied to the 203 units to come up with an estimated demand of 35.51 acre feet per year. Hey, you say there's going to be a minimum of landscaping? Uh, that's what they're saying that it would be minimum landscaping. Okay, I think what people forget <coughs> is that when this when this when this water is pumped into an area where there's minimal landscaping, most of it comes back to the city from the stand through the sewer system. Well, I don't believe the landscaping would be. That's what it, I said. Yeah, I said it would not that, go. That That's most right. Most of but, it, you know, in a landscaped area like this, would mm -hmm. come back to the city. That, that's correct, Councilman Shishka, because the, the water return would be coming from the dwelling unit itself that has high efficiency fixtures, and so the majority of the water return would be coming, and minimal usage would be for landscaping that would evaporate. Yes. Yes, that's what I think you're trying oh, to say. Okay. Comments from the committee? Well, I just see this as uh, another opportunity with... Um, property that's already uh, in the city limits, being able to have um, all of our public safety and um, other requirements being delivered. I'm just kind of concerned, of course, this is outside the scope of our decision today, but man, the amount of vehicles in that uh, intersection is just continuing to escalate. Um, but fortunately, I think for most of the residents here, it's probably going to be uh, just right turns down uh, Iron Springs into the city. So it shouldn't have too much impact, but uh, again, that's not what we're looking at today. We're just trying to calculate the uh, amount of water needed. And I remember looking at this when I was on Planning and Zoning Commission, you know, five, five or more years ago. So it's uh, finally coming to a, a development stage. Yeah, 20 years ago, it was gonna be a shopping center. Yeah. Right. So and and Councilman Good, it, it's actually a different project than the one that was that that you looked at. That was it's referenced in the memo. There was an original um, city development agreement mm -hmm. for up to 250 residential units. This will be a different development, actually fewer fewer units. And there will be a um, I think this is the one. There will be an item that comes to the council to essentially rescind the existing development agreement because this is a different project. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not on here yet, but <clears throat> back in the day, there was a lot of consternation about secondary access going through Forbing Park area. And I'm sure that probably be worked out in the future. If it truly was a, a full blown secondary access, it's not. There was a specific requirement in the original approval to not make it a full access, okay. to make it emergency only, and this retains that emergency only. Okay. Well, there's plenty of ways to get out of there, I guess would be my point. It's too bad it's not a full-blown access that would take those folks to another light that would be on Meadow Ridge Road. But if that is what is, that is what it is. So oh, that's the uh, northern uh, red indicator up there mm -hmm. um, as an emergency uh, exit. Makes it pretty, uh, At the time of the original agreement, that access, which is east, the project's turned sideways, um, had some input by the county because that Forbing Park area remains in the county, right. and they did not want a full access either. So at the time, the county was opposed to it. The residents of Forbing Park were opposed to anything other than emergency, and the developer of this project only wanted emergency access that way. So two yeah, primary I think the accesses. Original, uh, when I saw it, it had um, multi-story uh, condensed kind of um, 
buildings. That's correct, and they were at the south end of the property in the area that's currently undisturbed, so it would have destroyed a lot of the natural um, terrain down there to construct those buildings. So this is actually a better um, use of the land from the impact of not um, causing additional destruction of that um, pretty spectacular terrain at the south end. One thing I'd ask from staff if we can do it uh, before this goes to council is on this plat map is that you de depict by color what's in the county so we can actually see it. I mean, when I look at the map here and see Syria Peaks and Forest Road and Rocky Road, I know a lot of those are in the city, but also forming parks in the county and so over here yeah. on the other sides. And so if you could just do that, it would give us more of a visual to see. Actually, I do have another map. Okay. Uh, this is it shows very... that. So, so again, is... if we rotate that a little bit. So this is rotated the other way. Yeah. With, uh, north Rotated. to the right um <laughs> it's surrounded it's the by the right county so there's a significant right. topographic difference in elevation between this property and the property to the west which is um uh, actually a county church part uh, camp mm. and, and there's no potential for connection to the west because of that elevation difference no reasonable expectation uh, to the south, the terrain goes up. It's pretty spectacular. It's not disturbed for the most part. So again, trying to connect to the south into the county seems um, nearly impossible. The reason for the connections to Iron Springs Road is they're practical, and one of them at an intersection that was designed to uh, accommodate um, large-scale traffic. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on the dais here? Any Zoomers? No. No Zoomers. Hey, or motion. So moved. All right. Okay. Uh, move. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 3-0 to move this forward to the full city council. So let's go ahead and go to item 6A, which is infrastructure pumping and recharge update for 2021. Back in. So for all you folks that are out here, if you're wondering whether your projects now will move to the full city council for approval, okay? Or I should I say approval or disapproval? <laughs> well, I just want to be crystal, crystal, crystal clear that I, I'm not necessarily a developer supporting guy, but we need you just need to make sure that you're there at the full council to hear their comments. All right, thank you. You ready to proceed? Yes, ma'am. All right. Good, Good to morning, see you. Everybody. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, this is an item that's very familiar, so I don't need to spend much time on it. I think you're familiar with the chart. So we're looking at the pumping versus the recharge in this uh, time frame that we have, which is up through May. So your effluent deliveries, I might have to bump this up a little bit more, make it readable. How's that? Okay. Uh, 46 uh, acre feet. The surface water in May, 89 acre feet. And the total water pump for that month was 816 acre feet. If we look at the overall for this calendar at so far, pumped is 2,804. Recharge is 1,267. Is it missing a decimal point? That looks weird. <laughs> we'll round. And then you'd asked for, uh, you know, percentage. So what's the pump to recharged and on average? We're at a 52 right now. So um, as you can imagine, without the summer rains or much snowpack, we don't have much to work with in the reservoirs. The effluent side should generally stay the same um, unless that water is being moved off to direct delivery con contracts, which it is. So um, that's what your number looks like for May. Um, just as a reminder, you know, we don't have June because just as we're closing June, this packet's already due. So we'll have a little bit of a delay there. Uh, this topic from last time, 
we looked at permanent recharge and you wanted to explore that a little bit more. And in the packet, we did provide um, some options. Um, however, we're going to step aside from this a little bit right now uh, to mention that uh, utilities is still looking at this. Um, my recommendation last time was these are numbers we have to really dig into at the end of the year to come up with that permanent recharge number. What you have right now is just a metered number coming out. So they're continuing to look at this. Um, once there's confidence in those data sets that we can deliver on a quarterly or bi-yearly basis, then we will. But uh, this is still a little bit of a newer um, activity for the city and having that metering fall into place and be accurate. Uh, I think it's been last two, maybe three years, we de have defaulted to uh, an equation workup that we feel is strong to back the meter until the meters um, work better. And then I think the question mark is, well, why is this difficult? Well, your, your water meters are not carrying extra things in it, let's just say it that way, and your effluent meters are going to be carrying solids and other items in it, so that can trip up a meter. So they're working on it right now. Uh, so I apologize, we won't really go through this table today um, to make choices, as I think you were hoping to do. So if you can give uh, us a little bit more time at Public Works and let the utility staff look at what they're uh, working on to kind of hone in that meter, uh, we'll be better off. So if it's the pleasure of the group, we can bring this back uh, for an update next month, uh, the permanent recharge side. Um, or we can look a couple months out if, if that's the pleasure of the group. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have on. As long as it chart. doesn't take too much time of staff, I know we ask a lot of you to give us an update every month is a good thing. And know that we're not asking you to have this done until Public Works is re you know, ready to bring something of you know, meaningful substance back to us. Right. We don't want to mislead anybody uh, in this because we really are taking meter reads at this point. And then a permanent recharge number is a little bit more steps that we take at the end of the year to take EVAP losses off, to make sure everything's aligning between areas that are uh, still in a growth stance right now. So we're having more houses come online and the meter's trying to, you know, catch that outflow. Okay. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take any or I can step aside because your next topic's going to be very exciting. Leslie. I know that you've said you're working on it, and I, I truly believe that, um, particularly from the standpoint of the metering, um, what we get back from places like Granite Dells Estates and things like that. So how long do we work on it? I mean, you know, are we, are we so seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel? The director or? tells me otherwise. <laughs> I'm not making the decision on this. I I've, I've made the recommendation, and so right now I've been uh, made aware that you're, you're just the messenger. management. Yeah, yeah, and it's. Um, but I've been honest with you from the start, where um, this is a number that we have to crunch pretty hard because it is. I mean, I we don't have other communities doing this, and sure. as I said, you have a laminar flow with water, and you have some different flow that can be a little more turbulent with uh, wastewater. So. Um, they're working on it. So I think uh, trust your public works staff for uh, utility side. I'm not your utility well, I person. The public works staff they're working or part on of it. the public works staff is right but here before us. You can guarantee that we will move as quickly as we can to bring you a solid data set. Yeah, thank you. Yep. And I can assure you that we are making some headway on it, but it's a large amount of data. And we're cross checking it to make sure that it's right. We want the answer we give you to be correct. And there are influences into the data sets that we have to discount, and so that requires some judgment. And so if you would just be patient, we, I can assure you that we are making progress. We're just not quite there yet. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, anything over there on Zoom, me? Yes, Mr. Peter Krutnick. Okay. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Yes, Councilman Blair, Blair. you're all from... Leslie, can you put your first graph back up? Councilman Blair is often quoted as saying we get 90% of our water returned. Uh, figure one shows a highest figure of, there you go, uh, down the bottom of that. 
of, of like 60% off and much lower. There you go. Oh, well, sorry, 80% in February, 60s around there. So I just want to know, I know there's a lot of work yet to be done, but uh, I wish Mr. Blair would use these numbers instead of 90%. All due respect, Peter, that's not what I said. I said the new developments are returning above 90%, not the city as a whole. That's my clarification, and it always has been. So, you know, don't try to portray me as saying that we're getting 90% across the board in the city of Prescott. That's not true. But in the new developments where we have a closed-end systems, we're showing we're getting between 90 to 92% back, and that's a true statement. Sorry for misquoting you, Ben. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to item 6B. Hold on a second. Can we just go back to this? Sure. This doesn't mean we're just getting 17% back. It means that we're recharging 17% and sending the rest of the effluent out to contracts, right? You're solely comparing what your recharge, what you get metered into the recharge facility versus what you pump at the wells. So you're digging um, a little farther into it. And that's why we'll be careful. And we had our permanent recharge discussion. It's a different equation and set of information that you're looking at. So when we piece in that next piece for you, then we'll have more description here. But this right here is solely you asked, how much are we pumping? versus how much is delivered to the recharge facility. Right. That's what this is. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Let's do 6B, and this is a presentation on the Prescott Rodeo Grounds Rainwater Harvesting Project. I don't have this. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Good morning again. Kay Sitto with the City of Prescott, Water Resource Project Manager. Um, the um, Upper Verde River Watershed Protection Coalition is comprised of the City of Prescott, the towns of Prescott Valley and Chino Valley, the Yavapai County Flood Control District, and the Yavapai Prescott Indian Tribe. Um, it was uh, established in 2007, and one of the uh, members, John Munderlow with Prescott Valley, applied for grants from ADWR back in 2019, and he received three different rainwater projects. In February of 2021, DWR actually issued the contract for $65,131 to be distributed among those three projects. One of those projects is going to be here at the city's rodeo grounds. It's a below ground surface project for aquifer recharge. It has four perforated pipes that vary in length from about 50 to 70 feet long. And it's estimated to capture about 2,788 square feet of rainfall from the roofs of some of the buildings at the fairgrounds. Although I think that number may have even been improved upon since I wrote this original memo. There are four parts, four tasks to the grant. There's engineering and permitting, then construction, the third task is semi-annual monitoring, and the fourth task is outreach and the final report. We have completed task one, the engineering and permitting, and Matt Colleen here is, is here to show you a slideshow presentation that'll, it's very well done, very nice to look at. I know you'll enjoy it. Good afternoon, council members. Matt Colleen, Environmental Coordinator with the Public Works Department. And do we have it loaded?
Folder to do. Did you put in water resources, public works? Yep. Yeah. All right. Appreciate your patience. Um, here today to present on the re rainwater harvesting at the rodeo grounds. Um, so. Uh, as Kay mentioned, this is a, a project that was brought about through the Upper Verde River Watershed Protection Coalition. And I thought it was very telling that if we look at some of the <laughs> bullet points they have there, identifying and promoting effective conservation practices for all water users and implementing a watershed restoration and management plan that results in healthy ecosystems while optimizing water resources. This project captures both of those bullet points uh, very well. So um, $2 million was previously appropriated and on that bottom uh, square, you can see how they distribute it. Uh, that water management assistance program is the grant that uh, John Munderlow with Prescott Valley sought and was awarded. So the concept here, um, uh, the flyer you see on the right-hand side is one that Prescott Valley developed on a, a kind of a previous iteration of this design principle that we're using. And I think the benefit of that is that uh, we're not recreating the wheel here. We're doing something that's been applied in Prescott Valley and they are actively monitoring that. Um, some other kind of interesting um, components to this concept is that it really is uh, kind of capturing the best of both active and passive rainwater harvesting. Of active uh, rainwater harvesting, you have a storage component, and that's done, uh, you know, subsurface in this instance. And then with a passive rainwater harvesting, you have that benefit of recharge as well. So we're capitalizing both of those without the evaporative loss that can be associated with passive rainwater harvesting. So why the rodeo grounds? Uh, city staff were looking at a number of different municipal facilities from which we could harvest, you know, those, those rooftops and parking lots. And what we have here is a USDA NRCS uh, soil survey map. This one is specific to septic uh, absorption field suitability. And just like a stoplight, green means go and red means not so fast. Um, so what we have here is a lot of uh, granite and other unsuitable type materials. And that center blob here, um, right there is the rodeo grounds itself. And one of the reasons that it probably has that more beneficial or, or more conducive to um, recharge type of soils is we're right on the curve of Miller Creek, which comes right through here. So typically you'll see a cutting action on the outside and a deposition on the inside. So that's where all those alluvial kind of sandy soils got deposited over the eons. And uh, it seems like a timely with the rodeo week just having come to a conclusion. Um, there's a lot of benefits to the site beyond the soils. Uh, one is that we have a lot of impervious surfaces that we're able to capture. We also have a long-standing history of the rodeo grounds um, as a stable site. Um, the site also brings in a pretty big audience. Uh, this is a message that we can share with them. Um, and on the other side, having a site that's been around for so long, we know there's been some soil manipulation over time that those maps don't necessarily account for. So it causes us to move forward with caution and uh, seeking you know, good uh, studies and demonstration of suitability. So here are some of the grant details that Kay mentioned. Uh, the first uh, due date, if you will, was just a week ago when we submitted our uh, engineering plans that included uh, uh, absorption and percolation 
uh, calculations as well. Um, one of the things we'll be doing is uh, coordinating with rodeo events to make sure that we can move towards uh, construction for that deadline. Uh, there is semi-annual monitoring. We do water quality monitoring out there already in concert with ADEQ for the rodeo bio basin. Um, and so this represents kind of a two birds with one stone approach from that perspective. So additional benefits of this, uh, as you know, we mentioned, this is happening across the, the partnership. So the Chino Valley Territorial School, Yavapai County Library, all of these are highly visible public facilities um, so that we're demonstrating it on the ground so that it can potentially be used at a residential or commercial scale later on. Uh, the local engineering firm Civil Tech actually looked at this in a detailed study. The concept of doing macro rainwater harvesting, let's go beyond what we're doing at a residential level and look at those really big surfaces, whether they're parking lots or rooftops that are often associated with not only municipal features, but also commercial. What can we do to get that water in the ground uh, to increase our recharge? Um, so a uh, key note in that first bullet point from Civil Tech is rainwater that would otherwise would have been lost to evaporation. Um, this is uh, an actual uh, reality of what we have at the rodeo grounds, despite the soil maps description of the site. Um, as I mentioned, the Rodeo Bio Basin was a 2015 ADEQ grant that was uh, given to the city, and we constructed this basin here on the right. The basic fundamental is we capture the surface water flow um, with droppings in some cases. Um, but what this does, it actually has a sediment forebay, and then and we have uh, induced sinuosity going through here so that these sediments drop out here. This also has a, an additional infiltration zone. It was over excavated so that it actually helps sink that water in before it discharges to Miller Creek. So even with that bio basin in place, this is the type of discharge we have that um, contributes to our E. coli impairments and further downstream to the nutrient impairments we see in Watson Lake. So this is a, a field monitoring, uh, shows what we get on that inlet side up here by the fence when it first enters. Slight improvement here, we do field duplicates for quality control. And then we also look at what that impact is um, from a, just a, a coarse turbidity kind of look here, upstream and downstream. Uh, there doesn't appear to be a significant uh, negative impact from it, although we know that there is stuff in the water. So this uh, will be part of um, this project as well. So we're gonna be reducing the effect of surface flow that is reaching the site and scouring sediment and uh, other uh, materials. So to make sure that we were suitable, we went through and did a pretty extensive uh, soils and perk test. Um, this is actually the second one. The first one was uh, we went through and we're simply not getting the results we had hoped for. And all of those were done at this higher level here. Um, but before we closed up those perk holes, um, we had uh, our streets maintenance crew uh, dig a little deeper with their backhoe before we closed it up on a Friday afternoon. And what we found is just on that initial attempt that we, we poked into a layer that had a much more improved percolation rate. And what we kind of realized, uh, these lines represent rough um, kind of soil profiles. And if you remember back to that uh, historic picture of the old Model T or what have you um, with the soils, there's been a lot of surface manipulation here. And this uh, soil profile really demonstrated that. This was a, a very clay type uh, soil that really just did not perk it well at, at, at all. Um, and so by poking down further, we found a suitable profile in here to aim that recharge water at. So the catchment area from that historic photo, um, when we went out, we were working with uh, not only rodeo personnel, but also uh, our streets um, a drainage crew um, to make sure that we understood the full catchment area. Initially, we really expected it only to be barn B over here on the far right-hand side. But as we did field truthing, we realized that all this side of the Macklin building 
and both sides of the grandstand here all drain down and into this fixture. Um, what you can see from one of the city's uh, aerial photography here, this is the area where we're capturing and you can see a wetted imprint here. And so what we had is uh, basically a kind of a seeping, a continual seeping that went in and kind of saturated the, the stock pens and uh, practice uh, arena here. The uh, pixelated dots here are actually from a hydrologic study the city had done and represent the cumulative discharge. Um, so kind of a cubic uh, feet per second type uh, measure here. And what this actually shows, there's a separate storm drain here that captures most of this parking lot. Both this plume and this one are really just a manifestation of this water not having anywhere else to go. So it shows up out here. And with that clay layer at the top point, we're not recharging that even though it's an open dirt field. We're going to lose a lot more to evaporative loss than we had suspected initially. Uh, so uh, the catchment area, as is stated here, is uh, just over three quarters per uh, the design estimate. And then if we look at, if we capture 80% of what's coming off the route per the NOA estimated average, we'd be looking at a recharge of an acre foot per year. So these are actual design plans where we show our catchment areas here. This is existing infrastructure all the way to here. So really our infrastructure is gonna be coming in right in this area. And what we've done is we've actually designed it. So if we do get some of those really heavy rains like we saw last week when White Spark Campground got you know, over one and a tenth inch in less than 30 minutes, we do have a bypass ability so that we're not clogging the system or otherwise sending the water somewhere that it's not intended to go. And so what happens is we go here, we have a distribution area where we have the percolation. Um, it's hard to see because of scale here, but as each trench has a percolation pipe in it. And then it also has a, a coarse fill, much like you would with a septic uh, f leach field. Um, if it gets too much, it simply goes through and bypasses into the bio basin, which we have right in this area. So what that does is it allows us to percolate to a certain level. We have maintenance ability here. I reviewed this with our drainage maintenance crews to make sure that they not only understood and could give us feedback on the process or, or the design, but we were designing something that had the, you know, was feasible to maintain. We're not creating something that's gonna be a, a burden long-term. And we've got multiple points where we can do, basically allow that sediment to drop out before going into these leach fields. So uh, those were just uh, submitted last week, as I mentioned. So the next steps will be construction. Uh, we are working closely to coordinate that with rodeo events so that it doesn't otherwise impair their ability to have events. I know that they've been amping up their number of events recently. Uh, the monitoring, as I said, we are looking at both water quality and water recharge monitoring. The water quality ties right in with what we're doing for our MS4 permit through ADEQ. So uh, again, we're getting the recharge benefit, but we're also utilizing this as kind of a good housekeeping measure under our permit with ADEQ. Uh, we'll be doing uh, signage at the site and additional presentations like this one to share. And uh, at this point in time, uh, we're happy to take any questions or comments you may have on it. Have you shared this with the rodeo group? Uh, not directly, no. I'd probably be a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that the rodeo is over with now, you know, their board would probably be more than happy to see this taking place because it does benefit that rodeo grounds. Yeah. And taking away some of the, you know, they had cattle and all kinds of animals back there. It's all subject to that moving across that property into Miller Creek. So, yeah. Be a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. I concur. And all of this infrastructure is outside of those areas identified by the lease agreement with the rodeo. So it's on areas that um, obviously we want to be good partners with them and work with them, and we'll do that. Um, but this isn't subject to that lease agreement specifically. Right. And, and I didn't think it would be, but it, yeah. due to the fact that it's in that vicinity, it would be a good idea so that they know what we're doing out there. Right, absolutely. And what we also did is design features into it so it doesn't impair their ability to maintain that area as, as a parking lot. So a lot of those uh, surface apertures we've recessed, so they're not going to be subject to a tractor blade or a mower or anything like that. So we've definitely kept that in mind as well. Perfect. Well, I appreciate the presentation. 
yep. is very informative, and I'm I'm glad to see the Upper Verde Watershed Coalition is nothing something more than just a name out there that somebody thinks we're just a group that meets and doesn't do anything. And being part of that group since it was originated in 2007, this is a happy show here. Yeah, and it, and it'll be reiterated in both Chino Valley and uh, at the at the at the county library. So, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Yep, I, I didn't realize you rode Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the the timeliness of it coming off this week. Uh, yeah, it, it's a little a side gig I had. Any other questions, Phil? Oh, I just uh, <clears throat> think this is a really good project, and uh, as long as we can coordinate it with the new uh, um, Prescott Frontier Days uh, rodeo lease, to make sure that um, there are plans for future capital and development, things like that, don't uh, interfere or uh, reduce the ability of this project to deliver on what it uh, looks like it'll be able to do. Anybody on Zoom? Yes, we have Leslie Hoy. Go ahead, Leslie. Hey, thank you, Matt. That was really good. <clears throat> and I'm happy to see that the coalition is um, investigating stormwater recharge, which is one of our few augmentation opportunities. But I wanted to go back briefly to um, what Leslie Grazer had said about recharge um, with regard to the pumping versus recharge graph. I'm embarrassed to say that I never have thought about um, when we talk about the effluent we're capturing from houses, everything that's in it, when we, no matter whether we have efficient toilets, washing machines, sinks, et cetera, um, and so I think it would be really useful and educational if the coalition, I mean, if the <laughs> subcommittee could have a presentation on what the issues are when we capture effluent, even from the new um, subdivisions and the metering there with, in terms of what's in the effluent, what needs to be removed from the effluent and after everything's removed, how much water is actually left to recharge. Did you follow any of that? Yeah, but I think it was a bit outside my wheelhouse. I defer to Leslie on that. Well, we appreciate that, Leslie. And I. And then there's a point that's well taken on that, especially when you start talking about pharmaceuticals that might be dumped down the toilets uh, in different occasions that may not be getting filtered out. It'd be nice to know just what level is being filtered out. Thank you, Leslie. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Peter Krupnik. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. I'm here. Uh, I hate to say this, but I fully second and agree with uh, Mr. Blair's initial comments on this issue. Uh, Matt, I'm glad to see this project moving moving forward. Uh, question. Uh, we've had two other recharge projects in the last few years, uh, the Senior Center on Rosser and Taco by the Hospital. Can, can you comment on how much water we're getting back and how those are working? So I am the water quality person, not so much the water quantity. Uh, from a water quality perspective, uh, we've monitored uh, the so-called uh, Taco Basin, also known as Whipple Basin between Taco Bell and the hospital. Um, we've monitored that. So input E. coli levels versus output E. coli levels. And in most events, we see a 50% reduction there. That was actually confirmed by similar readings at both the Rodeo Bio Basin and the Adult Center. Um, that partnership with Prescott Creeks, well, DEQ basically uh, kind of stopped participating in that partnership effort. And so we do additional monitoring at those sites, but not the same level we did say a year or two ago. From a water quantity perspective, I'd uh, defer to some of my colleagues here. Thank you, Peter. That's a, good, um, that's a good avenue to take at one of these meetings to have that presentation. So that's something to look forward to in the future. Thanks for the comment. I got one other one other question, if I can whittle off the agenda. But Watson Lake is really, really low. Can you address water quality in Watson Lake? Not at the present time. It's not agendized. So I have the attorney over here looking at me in a strange way. So anyway, we 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 will address that. But I assure you, back in the day when CVID Central or Chino Valley Irrigation District is 
Steve Shisky would remember that those lakes were drained every summer. So I'm just glad that we have some water in them to say we have lakes. So anyhow, thank you, Peter. And uh, I want to thank you, Matt, for adding to my vocabulary. Uh, sinuosity is a new one for me. Yeah. We actually measured that with DEQ. You take a tape and go back and forth. So a straight line versus that measure, that yeah. worm shaped one. So. Thank you for that. <laughs> Okay, we're down to item seven, which is general announcements from staff. Do you have any that need to be made? Are you good? Oh, okay. I just need to get an item open here. So this was added on to your agenda recently, a general announcement from staff, because sometimes we have something come in at the 11th hour and we can't get it, you know, in time for the packet. So, or uh, you had a question at your last meeting and we followed up. So to follow up on bark beetle, that's your number one here. Um, the city already has existing information on its website. It's on the main page. Let's click and see if it'll go. It went on here. Okay. Well, I don't know why you can't see it, but it's open on my screen over here. Drag it up. When in doubt, drag it up. Didn't like that either. Darn. Okay. Well, we won't worry about that. So if you have questions, <laughs> we'll work out that kink later. Um, if you have questions or your um, constituents have questions, it is front and center on the city's website, Bark Beetle, and some great information. So you're covered there. The next one, I'm not even going to bother to click on it because it won't open up anyways, I'm assuming. That's just for grins, though. Let's see if it'll open. This one is important to the city. Uh, the ADWR has now released the updated Prescott AMA model. So um, that allows us to move forward on projects that we have in motion. Sorry, I'm... This is our new spam software that we have in here. <laughs> well, now I can't even open it here. What so... you don't know, we can't talk about. <laughs> so um, what this pushes forward for you is your DNO modification uh, work through the consultants as well as your... Um, uh, comprehensive agreement number one. So this ties in heavily to that item you had in council a week or so ago with Golder and updating their contract. So now they're able to move because they have this piece from the state. And then the last one is the Governor's Water Augmentation Innovation Conservation Council Annual Report. Um, this one I would have liked to open for you, but I'm not even going to try because I've, I've learned. So here's a hard copy. And uh, this one speaks to the different committees that have been made, and these are looking at how is the state going to operate into the future regarding water management. Um, all these links can just be emailed to you after this um, meeting. So if you're interested in clicking on any of them and opening them up, you have them. And that's all I have unless there's any other staff comments. No others? Well, I'm happy to report that my cistern was full of water again. 1500 gallons over the last rainfall so my garden is happy and producing and i'm sure everybody's excited about that as i am <laughs> any other comments anything else on the zoom no nothing on zoom yeah yeah okay that's it thank you everybody and let it be shown that we have ended the meeting on time and thank you everybody for being here we'll see you next month